Greetings and welcome. Let's keep going. First of all, a clarification on the title. Turkish coffee house culture is fine as a title, but it's not my title. I call this lecture Northern Coffee and the Conquest of the Night from Yemen to Istanbul to London. Because I try to tell it as part of a story of early modern global developments or early modernity at the global level. And that also means I would, as a historian, we always try to assign a date to it. Maybe rather than call it a timeless Turkish coffee house culture, I'm going to be dealing with mostly what historians consider the early modern era, namely 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. Another title of another version of this will tell you of, it's a longish title, but I did it on purpose just to be playful and provocative, but that title gives you the range of interests <coughs> within the body of research where my coffee house work belongs. Namely, it relates to various other developments having to do with early modern urban life in general, and the culture of the coffee houses, consumption of coffee, and various other social beverages belongs in that category. And the title of that lecture, as I delivered it once at Boazic University, will give you the different aspects. How dark is the history of the night? How black the story of coffee? How bitter the tale of love? The changing measure of leisure and pleasure in early modern Islam. I'm really trying to deal with daily lives and matters of leisure and pleasure as very serious matters, because without them we cannot understand working lives either. As you may know, in the discussions of Peter Berg and others, and I know there are some academic historians here, so please excuse me for some academic references. And before I get going on the coffee houses, let me also explain another aspect of this and how it ties directly to both the historical, but also the more philosophical dimensions of discussions of modernity. One of the most significant aspects of modernity as a historical and experiential circumstance is the eagerness, or at least the readiness, to manipulate one's tempo, mood, psychological state, to modulate, calibrate, and manipulate one's daily rhythms through the use of various substances. Licit or illicit, obviously. Opiates, <coughs> alcohol, coffee, tea, chocolate, etc. One of the most significant aspects of modernity, I call this, and one could go on defining it as the rush to get a rush. The temptation to possess a thermostat to control one's ups and downs. And all of this has a deep history that should take note of certain developments in the late medieval era and then be centered in Istanbul some, for some key parts of the story. In other words, what I'm saying is Istanbul is the center of the world. <laughs> for a very important part of the story of modernity. And thus, the whole coffee house talk is really, I hope, part of a set of interests that you might take in many different directions, including <coughs> some philosophical debates on modernity. Coffee, just like sugar, coca, chocolate, and tea, whose stories have different centers of gravity. Obviously, coca would be centered, not the cocaine as we have it now, but coca would be centered in South America, uh, chocolate would be centered in the Americas, and then in Iberian Peninsula in the early modern era, as they made South America into their colonies. T is the center of gravity of that story would be East Asia. And the center of gravity of the story of coffee is obviously, and coffee is among the most important of these substances. That is right here in Istanbul. One more note, at least for the academically minded, or I turn to coffee, Marshall Hudson notes in his Venture of Islam, one of the greatest books written in the field of Islamic studies, I think the best survey book still, and, and one highly recommended, unfortunately, very poor Turkish translation. So 
you should try and read it in other languages if you uh, intend, and some have already done it. Marshall Hudson writes that the phenomenon of fascination with and popular use of mind and mood altering substances, which is what we are dealing with when we are dealing with substances that give us the rush, that make us wild, that give us ups and downs, that enable us to control our uh, daily rhythms and our emotional states as we run through those rhythms, etc. Uh, this phenomenon of fascination with and popular use of mind or mood altering substances is a development of the late Middle Ages, Marshall Hudson. In his vocabulary, it's the late Middle Period, he points out. And he's very right about that. So it does actually take us back before, to a period before the conquest of Istanbul or Constantinople, Istanbul. And with that, reference to some of the pioneers of these developments from which Istanbul took its inspiration, I will turn to the story of coffee. And those pioneers are, among them are Tabriz, for instance, where in the late Middle Ages there developed a very important urban culture that set the model later, and thus, for instance, <coughs> the uh, pride of Ottoman urban literature, Shehrangis, is based is not noted often, is based on a Persian late medieval prototype, the genre that flourished in Tabriz called Shehrashu. The puppet shadow theater flourished before the Karagöz in Mamluk Cairo. Karagöz, I think, is really way out there. I love it, the classical repertoire and everything. But nonetheless, there has to be a recognition of the fact that the late Middle Age, that the, the late Mamluk Cairo offered a good many sources of inspiration and the techniques of the puppet shadow theater as it then thrived in Istanbul. Or Shiraz, of course, where Hafiz and Saadi lived and for people of the early modern era, all the way actually into the 20th century from the Danube to Bengal, to educate any child in the ways of urbanity would mean teaching them the books of Hafiz and Saadi. <coughs> even among some non-Muslims, but primarily so for Muslims. So, this I mentioned only because I don't want to talk about Istanbul as the center of the world without giving due recognition to some ideas. And there are others I could mention, but this is sufficient. So, now to my story with coffee and coffee houses. Fernand Brodel, one of the best known and most influential historians of the 20th century and a tireless researcher on material life and the dynamics of capitalism, Brodel, has the following word of warning to historians of coffee. He says, there is a danger that the history of coffee may lead us astray. The anecdotal, the picturesque, and the unreliable play an enormous part in it. And he's right. Historians of coffee, tea, and such daily practices, practices related to consumption of such substances, can easily be taken in by the cute, the frivolous, the anecdotal, which is a lot of, a good deal of fun, but then there is the danger of not going to important uh, analytical places with it. And that is why Brudel's warning should be uh, kept in mind. And with that in mind, for the next 45 minutes or so, I would like to demonstrate that this particular topic actually does offer the researcher not only fun, but also pathways, pathways to an understanding of some serious issues in social and cultural history, and possibilities for broadening our appreciation of cross-regional and transnational dynamics in the early modern era, like the flow of liquids, coffee, and everything else. We can think of this as a cross-regional and transnational story, even if the center of gravity is right there. I will now cite Pechevi, who wrote about coffee and the introduction of coffee houses in the 1630s, with the hindsight of two or three generations, and has one of the most uh, descriptively but also analytically important uh, passages ever written on coffee. And I will cite Pechevi to you uh, at some length. With this picture now we can 
point two. The picture is from circa 1580, the oldest picture of a coffee on here. There are art historians, and who am I saying things like this? But please forgive me for another. This is from the Zubdetu Tewari in Chester Beatty in Dublin. And uh, this is the earliest <coughs> depiction of a coffee house anywhere that we have, extant anyway. And it is from circa 1580. I will show you details and explain certain aspects. But in the background, as you listen to Pechevi, I would like you to just have your eyes, make your eyes roam around and try and catch your own details as you wish. Okay, here's Pechevi. Until the year 1554, <coughs> in the high God-guarded city of Constantinople, as well as in Ottoman lands generally, coffee and coffee houses did not exist. About that year, a fellow called Hakam from Aleppo and a wag called Shams from Damascus came to the city. They each opened a large shop in the district called Tahtakale and began to purvey coffee. These shops became meeting places of a circle of pleasure seekers and idlers, and also of some wits from among the men of letters and literati. And they used to meet in groups of 20 or 30. Some read books and fine writings, some were, back, some were busy with backgammon and chess. Some brought new poems and talked of literature. Those who used to spend a good deal of money on giving dinners for the sake of convivial entertainment, and this is a very important sentence for me in terms of a social historical analysis of the coffee houses. Those who used to spend a good deal of money on giving dinners for the sake of convivial entertainment found that they could attain the joys of conviviality merely by spending an aspirin or two on the price of coffee. It reached such a point that all kinds of unemployed officers, judges, and professors, all seeking preferment and corner sitters with nothing to do, proclaimed that there was no place like it for pleasure and relaxation, and filled it until there was no room to sit or stand. It became so famous that, besides the holders of high offices, even great men could not refrain from coming there. The imams and the muezzins and pious hypocrites said, People have become addicts of the coffee house. Nobody comes to the mosques. <laughs> the ulema said, it is a house of evil deeds. It is better to go to the wine tavern than there. The preachers, in particular, made great efforts to forbid it. The muftis, arguing that anything which is heated to the point of carbonization, in the reshme, that is, becomes charcoal, is unlawful, and issued fatwas against it. In the time of Sultan Murad III, may God pardon him, that's the time of this depiction, 1580s roughly. In the time of Sultan Murad III, may God pardon him, he's now deceased, there were great interdictions and prohibitions. But certain persons made approaches to the chief of police and the captain of the watch about selling coffee from back doors and side alleys in small and unobtrusive shops and were allowed to do this, moonshine. The preachers and muftis now said that it does not become completely carbonized, and to drink it is therefore lawful. <coughs> Among the ulema, the sheikhs, the viziers, and the great, there was nobody left who did not drink it. It even reached such a point that the grand viziers built great coffee houses as investments and began to rent them out at one or two gold pieces a day. Wow, that is great history right there. Almost all of the themes I would want to cover in dealing with the history of coffee and coffee houses are underscored by Pechevi. New and immensely popular forms of sociability. Secularization of public space. New sites and forms of public literary activity. Tensions with the authorities. New, form, new fora for political mobilization. New sort, circumstances to renegotiate the boundaries of prohibition and permissiveness for the academically minded Emre Bil Maruf ve Nehyen el Münker was being renegotiated through coffee and tobacco and various other <coughs> new practices or bid'ats, innovations of this period. And coffee, of course, the final theme would be, for me, coffee is a commodity and the coffee house is an investment. 
bitterly touches and underlines, touches on all of us. But let us go back to the beginnings of the use of coffee and to its stimulating effect. That is not even mentioned by the 17th century historian I quoted at length, presumably because the buzz of coffee was by then taken for granted. By the time it reached Istanbul, middle of the 16th century, coffee had of course been known in much of the Arab world for more than a century. The earliest reports on the consumption, let me go back to the coffee house picture, deal with that. The earliest reports on the consumption of coffee associate it with different mystics based in Yemen, but in each case with their concern with wakefulness. I quote from a sort from an Egyptian source from the beginning of the 16th century, before the story of coffee houses in Istanbul begins. At the beginning of this the 16th century, the news reached us in Egypt that a drink called kahwa. Now, in Cairo, it's still something alien. It, the news reached us that a drink called kahwa had spread in Yemen and was being used by Sufi sheikhs and others to help them stay awake during their devotional exercises. Zikir ve Evrat. Then it reached us, sometime later, that its appearance and spread there had been due to the efforts of the learned sheikh, Imam, Mufti, and Sufi al dabhani he found that among, the pro among its properties was that it drove away fatigue and lethargy and brought to the body a certain sprightliness and vigor. That's a great description of what coffee does. Or alternatively and more commonly, it is the introduction of coffee that is in Yemen is also attributed to al Shadili. I think there is in Ortaköy a coffee house that calls itself Shaziliye. That's a great name, bravo, perfect. And I quote, he found, in Al Shadili, he found that it made his brain nimble and that it promoted wakefulness and stimulation for the performance of religious duties. So he began taking it for nourishment and food and drink and he directed his followers to do so until the practice became widespread in Yemen, circa 1400 already, way before the story of the coffee houses, the introduction and use of coffee as a stimulant among the Sufis in Yemen. To the extent that coffee is a part of our modern lives then, and I argued already in the beginning that it is a very important part of our modern lives, we owe that part of modernity to totally unexpected figures whom we should also recognize in this story, namely Sufis from Yemen. In a sense, that is really how we started to be wired. After its early use in Yemen, just circa 1400, coffee reached Mecca and Medina in the mid-15th century, already at the time of the pilgrimage, we hear of tents which were set up during the time of the pilgrimage, where in the tents, namely, coffee was uh, cooked and served for customers. Early in the 16th century, in Cairo, coffee was spreading. The kinds of reports I read to you about Yemen had to do with that recognition that it was already uh, spreading in Cairo. And in Cairo, it appears that we have the earliest prototypes of coffee houses, but I'm hesitant to call them coffee houses because this is partly a climactic matter, I think. For all I understand from those depictions, and these are laconic depictions. Coffee places, coffee sale places in Cairo in the first half of the 16th century were more like uh, tostubifesi of our modern day Istanbul. Stalls, open air stalls with some fixed uh, <coughs> place there, but not necessarily a dome and a cover which brought together people for uh, long periods of conviviality and sociability. At least, none of our sources speak about the coffee house as a space like this before the emergence of coffee shops in Istanbul in the middle of the 16th century. The ones in Cairo use slightly different vocabulary, and the people uh, refer, who refer to the ones established in Istanbul refer to it as the very first though the story can still take some more research. 
I'll come back to the mid-16th century Istanbul, of course. Obviously, the story of coffee continues uh, in a very uh, big way after that point when that particular institution was created for the consumption and enjoyment of coffee. But to continue with the survey of coffee before I return to the mid-16th century, by the end of the 16th century, in less than half a century, even small towns around the Ottoman Empire from the Danube to Western Iran boasted of several coffee houses. In the 1590s, Sarajevo, Buddha, Safed, a very small town near Jerusalem, and I'll come back to the story of Safed because it has a lot to do with the conquest of the night but this time through Jewish mystics rather than Muslim mystics, all of these cities before 1600 boasted of eight, nine, ten coffee houses. Istanbul had close to 600 coffee houses in less than half a century. That is the wild popularity of an institution that you cannot just relegate to the level of a cute topic. This is a major mind-boggling phenomenon of social historical <coughs> development. Coffee shop owners were organized as a, again, <coughs> Nurhan Hanım must be mentioned each time we show the Surname for her great publication. Um, the Sur of 1582, only three decades after the establishment of the coffee house in Istanbul, had, as many of you know, a spectacular guilt parade that took nearly two months, and Derin's article on the Guild Parade is also worth a good read. Derin Terzol, whom I see back there. Um, here we have the florists, for instance, during the parade. But then, something really new and unusual appeared in this parade, which could not have appeared in any of the earlier parades. You don't see the crowd here because I focused <coughs> simply on the maquette, <coughs> on the model of the coffee shop that the coffee shop owner's guild or the coffee maker's guild, Kahveci Esnafı, pushed through the hippodrome during the festivities. Here, this was life-size for all we know, right? <laughs> on wheels. These were real human beings in there, seated. Imagine also the promotional <laughs> qualities, promotional advertisement aspect of this kind of uh, parade, obviously. That's why they went to great lengths. There was pride in one's craft, but there was also promotion. Here, the poor apprentices had to you know, push the cart. Coffee was cooked and served, and in 1582, as I said, this was already part of institutionalized guild life of Istanbul. Maybe a couple of years, maybe a few years before the parade, they must have been made into a guild. Um, some of the verbal accounts of this parade tell us something very interesting which will play a major role in the future development of coffee houses. In 1582, one of the narratives that gives us a verbal account says that the coffee shop's customers, as they were being pushed in the cart, recited poems from Karajola. Of course, in the 17th century, Aşık Kahveleri will be mushrooming as one of the subsets, one of the categories of the larger coffee house development. Aşık Kahvesi is, until the 19th century, uh, the place where it rocked, really. I mean, that's where you went to listen to the latest and most titillating new poetry and music, usually with saws, but you know, all sorts of instruments could also be played. And many of the players of those, like Aşık Ömer was very, very hugely popular until the late 19th century, but now almost forgotten. Anyway, here we have the beginnings, the seeds of all of this in both visual and verbal account. The development of coffee houses also gives us a good many instances of entrepreneurial creativity. This is yet another element that should be recognized. Imagine the first two, the two Syrians. 
everywhere I speak about coffee, I plead for having some kind of public monument built in their honor. This is one of the most important stories of modernity. Here in Istanbul, it starts in Tahtakale. And one might as well recognize not just those two, but the whole scene of the early coffee houses, I think, with a public monument. This is my personal plea. Imagine the entrepreneurial creativity there. Two people are selling coffee. Coffee is already consumed. Sufis I mentioned at length. But also in private homes, coffee was being consumed long before coffee houses. The earliest mention of coffee in Istanbul, in fact, is from the Wakfiya, from the endowment deed of Barbaros Hayrettin, 1537. He endows his house, his own home, Menzil Wakfiya, and in it, one of the units mentioned, like sofa, like a kenif, like hammam, one of the units mentioned is Kahve In 1537, in Barbaros house here, here in Istanbul, then people were enjoying one room relegated for that purpose. So the story of coffee and entrepreneur created that I'm coming back to, these two Syrian merchants, they must already be selling good amounts of coffee. Coffee enabled, actually, the merchants of Cairo and Damascus and Aleppo to bounce back from the post-Magellanic losses of the circumnavigation of the Cape of Good Hope. You know, the transit, Asia-Europe transit trade, trade used to go over the Middle East, more than 90%. There was no other chance. Russia was too cold, the geography is impossible, and one did not know about the possibilities of circumnavigation. So the Middle East and whatever polity ruled there enjoyed this position. But after 1496, was it 96? Magellan? Yeah. <laughs> the first shipment of spices is 1506. First spice shipment arrives in Lisbon, Venice, Cairo, Alexandria, uh, Izmir, Istanbul, Salonika. People went into, merchants went into depression. <laughs> They lost this position. Now the first spice shipment went, cardamoms and you know, caraway seeds, everything went without touching the soil of the Middle East. But before the middle of the 16th century, the region had already come back to its former levels in the transit trade. Not relatively, but absolutely speaking. Namely, in terms of the larger volume of world trade, only about 50% rather than 90 plus percent was now going over the Middle East. But that in itself was more than what was going over the Middle East in the age of, say, Mehmed the Conqueror. I hope you're with me on this because of the great augmentation of trade in general and the population boom of the 16th century. <coughs> So, back to our merchants and entrepreneurial creativity. They, circa 1550, saw the possibility of doing something much more with this stuff they already traded in, named the coffee bean. They opened up the coffee house, and it's a major story of success. Another important instance, or a very interesting one, at least to me, is this scene from Cairo. This picture I owe to Chida Kafestrobo, who found it um, in a manuscript having to do with geomancy, the top of the palace. In any case, this is a coffee house in Cairo, across two banks of the Niles, and here you have drive through <laughs> <laughs> See them? See them sipping coffee? The story of coffee as an item of trade, I won't speak about it at length here, but I've already indicated why it is important, I hope, is obviously not to be missed if you want to see the larger picture. And circa 1600, coffee was also spreading to the east, and for a while it was the major drink in Iran, in Iranian cities, until it was pushed back by tea. And the two, 
substances competed throughout this early modern era in different geographies, rather than thinking of armies, for a minute, for a few minutes, think about the conquests of coffee and tea, and it's a much more interesting story. And in Iran, coffee was for a while very successful, and uh, you know, the major <coughs> maidan in, Shah, in, in, in Isfahan that uh, Shah Abbas built was, of course, dotted by many of these coffee shops that are still called kahvehane, even though people have been that people have been consuming tea in them now for a couple of centuries at least. Something similar has been happening in Turkey in the 20th century. A place maybe called Kavehane, as you all know, but most of the consumption may be tea. Ah, okay. In the mid 17th century, a century after Istanbul, almost precisely, the first coffee shops were opened in Europe. The first ones that we know about, the first ones that were really registered are in Oxford, University down, not surprising, in Oxford and in London. 1651, the first one registered in London. And this one is a, this picture is from London circa 1660. Uh, again, all male, except for the innkeeper's daughters, all males, uh, clientele with a couple of interesting differences. A good deal of reading and writing went on in these spaces too. They quickly turned into art auction spaces, which, is, which does not have a counterpart. There were, of course, a good many visual depictions in coffee houses, especially in the 18th and 19th centuries that we read about, but not necessarily to sell art. Whereas these were, we know, art auctions. So on of those. There are, there are differences, but I won't dwell on them for uh, this presentation. In short, and before the in short, uh, in the mid 17th century, beginning in uh, England, it quickly spread to various other population centers of continental Europe, Paris, Vienna, etc. And by around the same kind of development took place, by around 1700, in half a century, there was not a small town in Europe, in continental Europe, without a few coffee houses, and major cities like London had several hundred. In short, in two and a half centuries, the seed of the plant that we call coffee had been discovered to stimulate wakefulness and sociability by some Sufis in Yemen, a social institution had been created around it in popular cities like Cairo and Istanbul. That social institution became immensely successful and popular among the rapidly growing urban populations of the 16th and 17th centuries. And the social institution was then exported to Europe through various intermediaries where with some adaptations it became just as popular in a similar amount of if you were to add the interweave, interwoven stories of tea and chocolate, with which coffee had some competition and some modus vivendi, you would have a global narrative of social beverages, soon accompanied by sugar, that constitutes one of the most significant aspects of early modernity and a counterpart to the emergence of new trade networks, new patterns of consumption, new modes of sociability exhibited by new urban elites, bourgeois, in the generic sense of the term, and middle classes. Coffee and tea clearly answered a certain demand. There is no other explanation for their success. This is a book printed in Germany in 1686, and it depicts some probably already figured out from, uh, from the captions, a Turk with coffee, a Chinaman with tea, and a Native American with chocolate. These three drinks were now recognized as part of something peculiar, something new happening in our times, that is the late 17th century. <coughs> Going back to Istanbul and to other Ottoman cities, let me now turn my attention to the social scene of the coffee houses. Who were the patrons of these establishments? Who went to the coffee houses? What kind of social scene can we talk about? 
this is uh, from the 18th century, well known coffee house scene. Um, while you look at that from the 18th century, I will again go to, uh, to some late 16th century depictions of coffee house clientele. Okay, Gianfrancesco Morassini, the Venetian bailo in Istanbul, describes coffee house patrons of 1585 as follows, and I don't totally agree with him, but let's follow him. All the people are quite base and of very little industry, such that for the most part they spend their time in idleness, sunk in idleness. Thus they continually sit about, and for entertainment they are in the habit of drinking in public, in shops, in the streets, black liquid. This is 1585, a European writer. A black liquid, boiling as hot as they can stand it, which is extracted from a seed they call cave, and is said to have the property of keeping a man awake. This curious, even paradoxical depiction of coffee house patrons as both sunk in idleness and indulging in a drink with the property of keeping one mentally alert is an early forerunner of 19th century modernist and orientalist depictions, when the institution had indeed become déclassé and came to be associated with backwards. That is the image of coffee houses when I was growing up. Uh, that is the image of coffee houses then as I read into late 19th and 20th century literature. That is the image of the déclassé image of coffee houses, is the image that was prevalent in the era of the 19th, and especially the 20th centuries in modernist and orientalist depictions. And that has some forerunners, yes. Uh, institution came to be associated with backwardness and idleness in the minds of modernizers in the Middle East and in Southeastern Europe, in the Balkans, for sure. Hence, the move to cafes, especially in the latest 20th century, and to institutions like Starbucks, which don't have any of the déclassé, any of the stigma of café honey. But that is, I just want to remind you, a really modern, phenomenon, that kind of assessment, back and forth, renegotiation of the social ranking of coffee houses. That is why I'm showing you this particular coffee house, of which there were at least a few throughout the city, which really catered to a clientele of you know, different strata, but definitely also of the upper classes. And the first depiction, remember, from 1580, had uh, Gentleman, let me go back to it for a second. A gentleman sitting not only with books and poems, okay, bounds can also be engaged in books and poems, but they have roses and carnations tucked into their turbans. These are elegant folk. These are zurefa, as the Ottoman literature referred to them, though not always in a positive vein, by the way. Zurefa can be dandyish, can be a bit too much, but it's okay. Zemheri Zurefasu, for instance, is a bad thing to be, etc. But, and this is part of the social vocabulary that's emerging with the culture of the coffee houses that I just want to give you a bit of. Okay, PGV mentioned in the citation I read to you members of different strata of the Ottoman elite, not to mention different parts of society, as uh, frequenting the coffee houses. Other textual and visual evidence supports indeed Pechevi. This is another famous one from Melling, late 18th century. And also, and with the coffee shop, this is another very big story, I won't belabor it, but for one sentence. A new culture of, is not saying too much, a new interest in and even indulgence in Seyru Temasha, in a culture of spectacle, looking at views <coughs> for contemplative reasons, for entertainment, for all sorts of purposes, but contemplation is certainly part of it. But this coffee shop gives you a very good example of the kind of view, the vista, that even some of the simple countryside coffee shops look for. And the vocabulary of Seyran, Seyri Temasha is all over the place in the 17th and 18th centuries that I cannot get into right now, but it's part of this phenomenon. Uh, Thévenot, the French uh, traveler who stayed in the city in 1655, noted that Istanbul 
deemed coffee to have medicinal properties and added, there is no one poor or rich who does not drink at least two or three cups a day. And he says, all sorts of people come to these places without distinction of religion or social position. It is not the slight, there is not the slightest bit of shame in entering such a place, and many go there simply to chat with one another. Coffee houses also became, this coffee shop is from uh, Topane. It's another famous 18th century depiction. And there, is, there are some poems written in and about this coffee house, which mentions Greeks, Armenians, Italians, Muslims, all sorts of people, as you would expect from a harbor area. Uh, as, as, and here you see. the visual eye, okay? But when Tevno mentions that there is not the slightest bit of shame in entering such a place, as opposed to taverns, he implies, he is speaking only of men. Coffee houses were, in the Middle East and the Balkans, and in the Europe for much of the time after their early introduction, male spaces. It takes a perceptive and gender-conscious observer like Lady Montague, wife of the British ambassador in the early 18th century, to see that Ottoman women were at least as concerned as men with conviviality, and they found ways to meet similar social demands, but in different institutions, the public bathhouses. Lady Montague observed bathhouses served as women's coffee houses. This is her vocabulary. She says, this is from the Zenanname, again 18th century. Zenanname of Indirin Fazil. But to go to an earlier bathhouse depiction, this one male, you can see the social scene as a very lively one. This is from Birinja Ahmet Albumen, right? The album of Ahmet I, I think? Yes. Yes, early 17th century. And here you have a real uh, social scene, coffee. I mean, the, the bathhouse ought to be understood as something much more than, uh, than a hygienic interesting or relevant space. Along with the introduction and proliferation of this new institution, the coffee house, we can speak of, we can observe the proliferation of various other older institutions but contributing to the same efflorescence of sociability and conviviality. Namely, if one, coffee comes from zero, it's the most innovative of these. But the bathhouse, which goes back to the Roman era at least, uh, public fountains which created piazza-like spaces around them, not to mention the huge fountains, like the Junjama at Cheshmasi. I mean, even the small neighborhood mosques uh, fountains created piazza-like spaces around them, and this was noted by contemporaries. This kind of space, if one looks at the <laughs> physical, at, at the nature of distribution of physical space in a city like Istanbul or Cairo in 1500 and 1800, even independent of the coffee house, the secular social spaces enjoyed a geometric progression bathhouses. André Raymond calculated the cubic meters of bathhouse space available in early modern in Ottoman Cairo. And the numbers are amazing as the city grew under the Ottomans. But the development of space outpaces population growth in all of these instances. Malls. This is of course the Grand Bazaar. But I'm now showing you spaces that functioned along with the coffee house in, uh, creating, uh, in creating avenues, possibilities for uh, different ways of socializing, often outside the control of the authorities, at least in terms of every instance. The malls, a public fountain here, really not a major one at, the, at, at all, but Public transportation is another one of these issues. When I think about social space, transformation of social space, and the emergence of class-to-class, gender-to-gender encounters, of more and more possibilities for 
such encounters and uh, the uh, uh, the concern of authorities with such developments which then finds its reflection in all kinds of documents such as the Muhammad Eftarnili or the court registers. Uh, transportation, public transportation which is a big part of daily life in, in a city like Istanbul of course, especially across the waters. And we know that in the 17th and 18th centuries there were dozens of different uh, tariffs or different, many different K's leading to uh, different case across the water in the Golden Horn or the Bosphorus. These uh, device, these vessels, vehicles, as they do today, created another aspect of the kind of development I'm talking about. And there are many uh, edicts that deal with uh, the tensions arising from these circumstances. Here we see this is a depiction from the 17th century. Uh, woman, man, Christian, Muslim. Well, I could also mention uh, the subject so wonderfully treated in the new book by Shirin Hamadeh, the uh, proliferation of parkings, parks, sorry, <laughs> promenades, and picnic spaces along with various other kinds of public spaces in the 18th century. And this is a famous example uh, of a promenade in the 18th century. So that has to be brought into the story. Genders hardly mixed, but all sorts of men indeed, going back to coffee shops. Genders hardly mixed, but all sorts of men indeed, without distinction of religion or social position, did visit coffee houses. Over time, coffee shops emerged with specialized clientele. Certain professions, groups, regiments of the military were likely to have their own coffee houses adorned with their own special insignia. But many were, at least the larger and centrally located ones, many attracted different sorts of people. Uh, and the 18th century examples I've shown you are uh, good instances of that. Due to the enticement of such environments, where different people of different communities, genders, not in the coffee shops, genders, but communities and classes uh, mixed. Due to the enticement of such environments, Jewish rabbi already in the 16th century were compelled to answer questions like, questions as to whether coffee prepared by Gentiles was prohibited not only on the Sabbath, but on the remaining days of the week as well. This is indeed a fetwa, a responsive question to one of the rabbis in the late 16th century. David, Rabbi David Ibn Abi Zimra, probably the first to face the question, he resided in Cairo, saw no problem with the beverage being prepared by a Namji. Coffee houses, however, were for him another matter entirely. I do not consent, he wrote, to its being drunk at the meeting place of Namjus. If it is indeed for medicinal purposes, one may sent for it and have it delivered home. So, <laughs> delivery is okay, but if you go to a that coffee house as a space, uh-uh, that you shouldn't do. And even if particular coffee houses were limited de facto, not officially by the way, not de jure, but de facto limited in terms of the religious, ethnic, or social backgrounds of their clientele, coffee house culture as such was not. It recognized few boundaries. An orthodoxy-minded Jewish scholar and poet, Menahem de Lonzano, and a musician poet named Israel Najara. He was that big poet of uh, Hebrew and Judeo-Espanol in the late 16th century. Many books of his were printed. Of course, there were printing presses of the Jews in the 16th century. In the late 16th century, some of his books were printed. Uh, these two felt obliged to produce Hebrew poems to melodies well known in Turkish lyrics among Ottoman Jews who frequented coffee shops in Safed, Thessaloniki, and other cities. In other words, Turkish songs were extremely popular in the coffee house circles, even if the coffee house was de facto limited to Jews only. They were singing Turkish songs. And this bothered some people. Thus, they commissioned arrangement, what we call in Turkish arrangement. <laughs> Namely, this famous poet, Israel Najara, there are two printings of his book. Israel uh, Najara uh, wrote, 
Hebrew lyrics to melodies that were already known in Turkish. But in order for it to be understood, you know, how are you going to know? He wrote the first line of the song in Hebrew characters in Turkish. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, you, you, you write Turkish lyrics to yesterday, Beatles. <laughs> Turkish lyrics all together, but the, in the beginning, in modern Turkish, let's say, you write yesterday, all my troubles seem so far away. <laughs> so, so that you know how to, how to go with this new line. Uh, it shows you the way the coffee house culture could spread independent of individuals. There's a much... Uh, uh, different layers to this story. Okay. It is not only the religious ethnic composition of the patrons of coffee houses, but also the new modes of patronage made possible by these institutions that transgress the social boundaries that the authorities of different communities would like to maintain. And similar things were happening in Europe, by the way. I just don't have time to get into it. Once they emerged, coffee house bans during the first century of coffee houses was quite common in different European cities. Some members of the Ottoman elite lamented the fact that conspicuous patronage and ostentatious hospitality had been rendered so inexpensive. Mustafa Ali, for instance, this example will explain what I mean. Mustafa Ali writes, he's in Cairo, and he says, when soldiers go in a coffee house and there have to get change for a gold coin, they will definitely spend it all. They regard it as improper to put the change in the pocket and leave. In other words, this is the manner of showing their grandios grandiosity to the common people. They come, instead of going back home with some change, they say, it's on me, it's on me, it's on me. This is what I mean by democratization of patronage. Ostentatious <laughs> hospitality is so cheap now. And the same kinds of discussion, actually, I can give you examples from London, that, that it's cost effective. In other words, <coughs> instead of <coughs> inviting people to a big banquet, you can give them just a cup of coffee and you're still being good. Uh, <coughs> one of the coffee house defenders in London, when the debate raged between the coffee house defenders and coffee house opponents, one of them wrote, in regard of easy expense, a taver tavern reckoning soon breeds a purse consumption. Namely, you spend much more in a tavern, you consume your purse. But in a coffee house for a penny or two, you may spend two or three hours and have, have the shelter of a house, the warmth of a fire, the diversion of company, and convenience, if you please, of make, taking a pipe of tobacco, and all this without any grumbling or repining. <laughs> Remember the sentence I focused on from Pechevi? Uh, he said, uh, instead of spending so many, Pechevi had written, those who used to spend a good deal of money on giving dinners for the sake of convivial entertainment found that they could attain the joys of conviviality merely by spending an aspirin or two on the price of coffee. It's almost the same voice as that of the London author. For a long while it remained an urban institution. The development of village coffee houses in 19th and 20th century, but I won't spend time on this uh, aspect of it. Uh, the political dimension of coffee house is probably also very obvious and I won't spend much time, but this picture shows you a coffee house scene in the 19th century. I couldn't find an earlier one visually, though there are many verbal ones. A coffee house scene where people discuss the sad news coming from the, uh, from the Bulgarian front, the Ottoman-Russian War of 1877-78, which was disastrous for the Ottomans and led to many political changes as well, including, remember, the abolition of the Constitution. And uh, here we have a uh, depiction of the way political news, gossip, and discussion could take place in the coffee shop, did take place in the coffee shop. Mm -hmm. The earliest verbal instances are, again, from the late 16th century. Selaniki says, again and again, people, whenever there was something to be tumultuous about, people started gathering in these new institutions called Kahvehane and spreading rumor and also mobilizing. Recitation of poems and romances, performances of uh, 
Karagöz and uh, Medah uh, entertainments, I again will just mention and move on because I want to say one more thing. There's the medical dimension of it all which is related to this, but I'll just uh, underscore one aspect of it, namely in terms of Galenic medicine, which was then the medical medicinal paradigm before the development of various other things which we now take for granted. When coffee was introduced, when tomato, pepper, all those new things, substances came into uh, the uh, world of consumption in the old world, in the 16th and 17th centuries, they were all evaluated and assessed in terms of the Galenic paradigm. Quadripartite, hot, cold, wet, dry. Everything has to fit into these, uh, in, into these schema, schemata. And uh, coffee was considered to be very dry. Now, women's temperament being wet in the Lenic medicine, this is no problem for them. They can consume coffee as much as they wish. But men whose temperament is already dry, if they were to consume too much of coffee, they might be enfeebled. This is the idea. And here, and here there is a wonderful petition, 1675, women's petition. This is one of the most often cited sources on the history of coffee, house, coffee and coffee houses. The women's petition against coffee, printed in 1675 in London, soon after the spread of the institution, they write a petition to the king in which they argue against coffee and coffee houses. And the basic argument is already here on the cover. Reynolds' petition representing to public consideration the grand inconveniences accruing to their sex from the excessive use of that drying, enfeebling liquor presented to the right honorable, the keepers of the liberty of Venus. <laughs> You get the point. So the spread and immense popularity of coffee has also been assessed against that background, and that same notion was widespread both in Europe and in the Ottoman world, given the prevalence of the, or the uh, importance of the Galenic paradigm. Until the early 18th century, Yemen, this picture is very enigmatic. Let me stay with the enigmatic picture then. Uh, on the history of the trade of this substance, I already uh, said a few words about the earlier part, the 16th century, how it became a large uh, element in the, in the way the Middle Eastern zone was able to bounce back. When coffee became popular in Europe in the late 17th century, Mercantilists started to take note. Mercantilists are always worried about the trade balances. Yemen was the only z place where coffee was produced at the time. Yemen had a monopoly, let's say, uh, for the coffee, for all of the coffee consumed in all of the Ottoman world and in Europe. And this bothered the mercantilists, obviously. This meant species of different European economies flowing for the, into the Middle Eastern economic zone for the purchase of larger and larger and larger amounts of coffee. And thus, beginning in the early 18th century, they started experimenting with acclimatizing the coffee bean in different colonies. The Dutch in Java and the French in the Antilles were the first to be successful in this in the 17 teens, before 1720. They were able to acclimatize the coffee bean but they were using cheaper labor, of course. Mm -hmm. And within half a century, this is the decline of Yemen. Really. Mm -hmm. Within half a century, the new coffee flooded the former Ottoman markets even. Uh, in the 1730s, European produced, colony produced coffee was being sold already in Erzurum. It had spread into uh, markets way beyond port cities. This, this kind of coffee of the new provenance. And because it was a bit more bitter, it was accompanied regularly by sugar. That's another story. Earlier on, in the 16th and 17th centuries, 
coffee was not necessarily or rarely, in fact, consumed with sugar. I'll stop the story of trade there and just mention the fine, just, just to have a few uh, sentences to at least indicate to you what I'm trying to do with the final theme, namely the conquest of the night. At least part of the tensions between the authorities and the coffee drinking public was related to the increasing use of the night time by the latter. And indeed, the increased use of the night time, now many historians such as myself, but independently of each other, have been discovering that, have been discovering as yet another one of those globally shared phenomena of the early modern era. Namely, what I call the conquest of the night, the increased use of night time for sociability, for entertainment, and for labor, alas, has been an ever-growing part of our lives since the 16th century. And it's a frontier still not fully conquered. If you think about it as a conquest, obviously people are still pushing their biological flux. Many of us do. I, I was going to say we all do, but some people may be more temperate than that. I'm not. We constantly push our biological flux. We consume substances to be able to do that for entertainment, to be able to watch one other movie, to be able to do some more homework or whatever, whatever. You know what I'm talking about. And this new, it came with a new attitude to mechanical flux that we could already uh, uh, identify in the 15th and 16th centuries, and the Ottomans are not really far behind in this development of a fascination with mechanical clocks, of measuring things by the hour, though there was a different way of hour keeping, measuring things by the hour in itself, as a regular part of daily life among the middle classes does not really extend into the Middle Ages. In terms of public entertainments, because there are so many accounts, verbal and visual, of public entertainment. I was able to go through lists of entertainments in the Middle Ages, in Cairo, say, or in Baghdad, and then in early modern Istanbul. One can tell the difference. Even within the story of Istanbul, there are many more nighttime events in the festivities of 1675 and 1720. You know, these are two major festive occasions. 1675 in Edirne, Özdemir Nutku published on that. 1720 in Istanbul, Tsunami, Behbi, etc., other artifacts produced. If one compares the nighttime events that take place on those dates to the festivities of 1582, there is much more in the later festivities than there are in the earlier festivities. Not only that, Hazar Fenisein, when he writes about the 1675 Shanrik festivity, he gives the different items, the different elements in the festive schedule, so to speak, by the hour. He says, Yatsıdan bir saat sonra, an hour after Yatsı, this band of entertainers came up to do X, and then an hour later than that, this band of entertainers came to do Y. And two hours after that, another band of entertainers comes to do that. There is no such timekeeping, not with the same regularity in the earlier ones. All of these are part of the same kind of development I try to underline here. And this, by the way, looks so modest, and by now we're very used to it, but when it was first introduced in the middle of the 16th century, it was a novelty, mahya, uh, to light up various public spaces in the city, especially the spaces around the public, uh, around the uh, sultanic uh, mosques, to light up these spaces uh, was a new idea and much debated when it, when it, when it uh, came into being. Some people thought it was really improper. And we know that though uh, the uh, institution became very popular, or the practice, the institutionalized practice became very popular. And by the middle of the 17th century, at least, we know that things were written, legible things, such as Grelo writes that uh, the name of a sultan would be written in the space here with bulbs, with, with candles rather, with uh, oil lamps. Um, if there was a particular victory, or if there was a birth in the 
a dynastic household, etc., etc. And then festivities. These, these are both of these depictions are from 1720, and this Yohannan here is the great master of the 1582. Uh, at least that one. There is hardly a scene like this. A night scene is a regular part of the depictions of the festivities in the 1720s, both visually and verbally. Here is a good example of that. Another example of that same year, 1720, the summer months, great days for the city, uh, fireworks, etc. The development of fireworks is also during this period that I'm talking about. Then you cannot really enjoy fireworks, but in the night. Karagöz, you cannot really, really enjoy. Karagöz you can perform during the day in dark spaces, but ultimately the genre, the technique, lends itself much better to the nighttime. I'm sure you would appreciate that. All of these developments coming together with the development of a new concern among mystics, Muslim, Jewish, maybe also Christian, though I haven't been able to find any examples of this despite my attempts, concerned with nighttime vigils and nighttime devotional practices having to do with spirituality. A central element in Safed spirituality, now I go back to that little city of Safed, which has been studied, fortunately, very much uh, along my lines. A central element in Safed spirituality, especially in its Lurianic ver variety, was the considerable stress it placed upon nocturnal forms of piety, nightly forms of piety. And of course, the Lurianic mystics were decried by the more orthodox rabbi for, for, the, for their nightly practices, such as the super erogatory prayers of the Muslims that the uh, more orthodox folk like the Kadazadeli did not find uh, proper. A central element, as I said, was the considerable stress it placed upon nocturnal forms of piety. Some confraternities were known by names such as early risers, awakeners of the dawn, or watchmen of the morning. Something is known about coffee consumption in Safet, and among these circles at this time, it was growing at rates alarming to the Orthodox establishment that also opposed certain forms of Urianic mysticism. The introduction of coffee brought with it Beyond the mere availability of a new stimulant, the emergence of a new perception of the night in which the hours of darkness could be shaped and manipulated by human initiative rather than condemn man to passive repose. Looking at the changing uses of the nighttime for conviviality and public entertainment, as well as the new turn to nocturnal vigils among both Muslim and Jewish mystics, as well as the more secular members of such confraternities, one could observe that the introduction of coffee and coffee houses in the cities of the Islamic Eastern Mediterranean during the 16th century accompanied the gradual breakdown of some of the conventional divisions between day and night. The latter night became associated to an increasing degree with activity rather than repose and with sociability outside the home. Coffee and the coffee house did much to change the relationship of individuals and social groups to the night. Outside the few nights in the yearly calendar wherein festivities took place or spilled over into hours of dark, men now went out at night to drink, meet with others, exchange information, ideas or pleasantries, and otherwise amuse themselves. Candle production and consumption also reached new heights, by the way, and I don't belabor that story, but cable, a candle in the endowments made for colleges, madrasas. The amount of candle allotted in the 15th century versus the amount of candle or oil lamp material allotted in the 18th century, again, proves my point. It would be foolhardy to argue that coffee is the factor behind the extension of human activity and public sociability into the nighttime in the modern era. But coffee accompanied that momentous change and a fine companion to our modern tempo it has been. It made the morning and the night more manipulable than they had ever been and thus served as a tool in the conquest of the night that is associated with modernity and is still unfolding. Thank you.